Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi, Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different aspects of the recombinant DNA technology. And if you recall, in the previous chapter, we were discussing about the uh, host and the transforming agents. So, we have discussed about the different types of host and also we have discussed about the corresponding uh, uh, transforming agents. So, we have discussed about the bacterial host, we have discussed about the mammalian host, we have discussed about the yeast and as well as we have discussed about the insect cell line as a host. And correspondingly, we have also discussed about the different types of vectors, what you can use in different types of uh, host system. In uh, this particular chapter, the gene cloning, we are discussing about how you can be able to isolate the gene of your interest, how you can be able to uh, you know, uh, uh, deliver the DNA into a part, uh, once you generate the recombinant DNA, what are the different enzymes you are going to use and so on. And in the previous chapter or previous lecture, we were discussing about the how you can be once you generated a recombinant DNA you, with the help of the restriction enzymes and the ligase, uh, how you can be able to deliver this DNA into the host cells. So, in the previous lecture, we discussed about the delivery of the DNA into the uh, bacterial expression system. We have discussed about the how you can be able to perform the transformations. And then we also discuss about the, uh, the mechanism and as well as the basic uh, information what you require to deliver a particular DNA into the bacterial space system. We have discussed about the transductions and all other kinds of things as well. Now, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about how you can be able to deliver a DNA into the mammalian expression system. And once you deliver the DNA into the mammalian expression system, uh, how you can be able to screen these uh, transform cells, how you can be able to select the transform cells from the untransformed cells. Now, if you recall, uh, when we were discussing about the DNA delivery in the host, we said that uh, the it is only possible when you are going to work on to the surface chemistry of the host or you actually know about the surface chemistry of the host and the charges on the DNA, right. And we said that it is difficult to, uh, to, uh, to uh, work on the surface chemistry of the host cells, right. For example, in the bacterial expression system, you can actually be able to uh, modulate the bacterial uh, surface chemistry simply by making it more loose with the help of the divalent cations. Whereas, in this case, it is difficult because uh, you cannot be able to make the plasma membrane more leaky so that it will accept the DNA. So, the other option is that you can actually be able to work on the charges on the DNA so that it should be get accepted by the mammalian expression system and it can be uh, it, it can be delivered into the mammalian, mammalian cells. So, when we talk about the prokaryotic system, uh, the prokaryotic system, uh, most of the prokaryotic system or even the yeast, you are mostly working on the surface chemistry of the host. Whereas, when you talk about the eukaryotic system, uh, except the uh, yeast, when you talk about the mammalian expression system, you are mostly working on the charges on the DNA. So, that the DNA what you uh, would like to deliver is acceptable by the cell because of the simple reason that the, uh, the surface chemistry of the eukaryotic cell is much more complicated and surface chemistry of the eukaryotic cell uh, like for example, the plasma membrane is delicate. So, if you try to disturb the, uh, the plasma membrane of a mammalian cell, it may not actually be, uh, it may not accept the DNA and uh, those changes may actually also damage the cells. So, uh, there are multiple methods by which you can be able to work on to the charges on the DNA. Okay? There are four methods uh, what people are using in the DNA delivery in the mammalian cells. One is called as the chemical transfection method, the other is called as the liposome or the lipocomplex methods, the third is called as the bacteriofactin and the fourth is called as the transductions. Majority of these methods, whether it is a chemical transfection method, liposome mediated method, bacteria mediated method or the virus mediated 
uh, denier delivery all are working on the basic principle that you are actually going to modify the surface chemistry or you will uh, modify the DNA in such a way that it is actually going to accept by the cells. Let us first discuss about the chemical transfection method. So, the chemical transfection method is being used in such a way that you know that the DNA is negatively charged right. So, you have a DNA which is a negatively charged. Now, DNA is negatively charged. So, you have to neutralize these negative charges and how you are going to neutralize the negative charges that you are going to add a positive charges right. So, if you add some kind of positive chemical agent it is what will it will do is it is actually going to neutralize the negative charges and that is what is it actually going to impart a positive charge and because of that the DNA is going to be now going to carry a neutral charge or it is actually going to be positively charged and these charge part charge nucleus or the positively charged nucleus or the nu nucle uh, or the DNA covered into these particles or chemical uh, molecules are going to be engulfed by the uh, mammalian cells by a process of phagocytosis. Uh, I am sure if you do not know about the process of phagocytosis. Uh, you should uh, go through any of the standard uh, immunology book and it is actually going to give you the more detail about the phagocytosis. So, what will happen is that the DNA is negatively charged you are adding the chemical transfection agents which is positively charged uh, uh, molecules. So, they will cover the DNA with the positive charges and then this positive charge DNA is going to be taken up by the cell because it is actually going to make the big particles and it is actually going to taken up by the cell with the process of phagocytosis and once this get enter into the cell it is actually going to you know this positively charged molecules are going to release the DNA and then it will go to the nucleus and there it is actually going to participate into the recombination process or it is actually going to participate directly into the transcription and translation. Apart from that there are other methods like for example, you can be able to do the direct transfer of this DNA into the cell uh, with the help of the some of the method like if you remember we in the previous lecture we discussed about the ballistic method or gene gun method. So, those kind of method also can be used for the mammalian cells as well. So, the first method is the chemical transfection method. So, the principle behind the chemical transfection technique is to the coat or complex the DNA with a polymeric compound to a reasonable size precipitate right. It, faci it facilitate the interaction of the precipitate with the plasma membrane and the uptake through the process of endocytosis or the phagocytosis. There are multiple chemical compound that have been discovered which can be able to make the complex and deliver the DNA into the mammalian cells. So, one of the such chemical is the chemical uh, the cal calcium phosphate method. So, the, in this method the DNA is mixed with the calcium chloride you know that the calcium is positively charged metal right in a phosphate buffer and incubated for 20 minutes afterward the transfection mixture is added to the plate in a drop wise fashion. DNA calcium phosphate complex forms a precipitate and deposited onto the cell as a unilayer. The particulate matter is then taken up by the endocytosis or the phagocytosis into the internal storage of the cell. The cell the DNA is then escaped from the precipitate and reached to the nucleus through an unknown mechanism. The method suits to the cell growing in a monolayer or in a suspension, but not for the cell growing in the clumps. But the technique is inconsistent and the successful transfer depends on the DNA phosphate complex particle size and it is very difficult to control. So, what happen in the calcium phosphate method is that you have a DNA right and this DNA is negatively charged right. So, when you add the calcium phosphate, uh, the calcium phosphate uh, is going to uh, you know uh, coat this ok, it is going to coat this and it is actually going to make the particle. So, you are actually going to have a particle where the DNA is present inside. So, this is going to be a particle like this right. And suppose you have the cells which is on the petty dishes right. So, you have a cell in the petty dishes like this right. So, what you are going to do is you are going to make these particles and then you are going to add these. So, what will happen is these particles are going to sit onto the cells right 
and then these cells are going to taken up by a process of endocytosis or the phagocytosis and then the once it get enter into the new into the cell then it is the uh, then it is going to release the dna right it is going to release the dna inside the cell and it is actually going to be taken up by the uh, by it, and it will reach us to the nucleus with a with to the mechanism which is unknown and then it is going to uh, you know do the participate into the different types of uh, activities like it is going to transcribe or translate and all those kind of things. The dis one of the major disadvantage of the calcium phosphate method is that it is severely it is it causes the physical damage to the cellular integrity of the cell due to the particulate matter settling on the cell and it results in the seduce viability and the cytotoxicities of the cell. So, these particles which are very heavy and they are actually causes the damage to the uh, to the mammalian cells they will actually going to reduce the uh, the cell viability right and uh, as a result these method is not very very popular. Then we have the another method which is called as the polyplexis method. So, an alternative method was evolved where the DNA was complexed with the chemical agent to form the soluble precipitate, precipitate such as the polyplexis through electrolytic interaction with the DNA. A number of polycationic carbohydrates such as D, dextran, positively charged cationic lipids, polyamines uh, etcetera are used for this purpose. The soluble aggregates of DNA with the polycationic uh, complex is readily been taken up by the cell and it reaches to the nucleus for the expression. So, in this method what you are going to use is you are going to use the, uh, the cationic lipids or the transfectin. So, what you are going to do is you are going to take the DNA on one side, you are going to take the lipids on one side, then you are going to mix them together and you will wait for the 15 to 20 minutes. And so that it will actually going to make a DNA liposome complexes and then you are going to add that to a cell and what will happen is that it is also going to settle the same way as we have take we have just discussed about the calcium phosphate method and then the cell is going to take up this by the process of endocytosis or the phagocytosis. Now, the third method is the where you are going to use the liposome and the liposome lipocomplex uh, transaction method. So, the third method where you are not using the cationic lipids, instead of cationic lipids you are using the liposomes. Although you may not be aware of about the liposomes, so liposomes are, uh, are the uh, vesicles actually. So, when you what you do is when you, if you take the lipid molecules and if you put them together and if you sonicate the lipid molecules are going to arrange into uh, you know the into the aqueous environment right where the uh, where the uh, the uh, hydrophobic uh, uh, where the polar groups are outside and the uh, the basic uh, the uh, lipid chains are inside right and this basic this structure is called as the liposome right. So, earlier we were using in the in the lipid in the lipo uh, polyplexis method we are using the cationic lipids so that it will bind the DNA right but it is not forming the liposomes. Whereas, in this case what we are doing is we are adding a liposome so that it is actually going to entrap the DNA. Now, this liposome you are going to add to the cell right and these liposomes are actually going to fused with the membrane right because this, this is also a lipid membrane, the cell is also going to have a lipid membrane. So, these are actually going to fused with the lipid membrane and that is how it is actually going to deliver the plasmid. So, another approach of DNA transfection in animal cell is to pack the DNA in a lipid vesicle or the liposome. In this approach, the DNA containing vesicles will be fused with the cell membrane and deliver the DNA to the target cell. Preparation of the liposome and encapsulating DNA was a crucial step to achieve the good transfection efficiency. Liposome prepared with the cationic or the neutral lipid facilitate the DNA binding to form the lipoplex and allow the uptake of these complexes by the endocytosis. The lipoplex method was applicable to a wide variety of cell and found to transfect even the large size DNA as well. Another advantage of the liposome or lipoplexis method is that it is adding a, a ligand in the lipid bilayer. It can be used to target the specific organ in the animal or site within the. So, what, it, what this li last line says that if you suppose add some antigen for example, if you add a protein molecule and if this protein molecule 
has the affinity for the liver cells right what you can do is you can use these liposomes to deliver this dna directly into the liver cell okay and that's how you can actually be able to do a targeted delivery of the uh, the liposomes so this is what exactly we have shown you have a, uh, you have a plasmid dna you have the li lipofectamine reagents what you going to do is you mix them together and then it is actually going to form a dna protein lipid complex and uh, uh, you are actually going to add that so that when you do that it is going to settle set on to the cell and then it is going to taken up by the uh, process of endocytosis once it reaches into the endosome right so this vesicle for a bound structure is called as endosome the dna is going to be released from this and then it is actually going to be available or it is going to enter into the nucleus and it is going to participate into the transfection and the translations what is the advantage and the disadvantage of the lipofectamine uh, okay uh, so the advantage of the lipofectamine it is has high efficiency the effectivity for the many cells type including the hard to transfect mammalian cells it has low toxicity so remember that the calcium phosphate method is giving the very uh, high uh, toxicity because the those particles are damaging the cells whereas in this case you are using the liposomes so it is actually going to be a milder method and it is giving the low toxicity so generally low low, toxic, low cytotoxicity compared to the other transfection methods such as electroporation then it also be very simple calcium phosphate method is very very complex because you are supposed to make those particles and they are very difficult to form and it is very inconsistent also monday they may form and then some other day they may not form so it is easy to perform without the need for the specialized equipments what are the limitations uh, of the lipofectamine so it is going to be used for the transient expression so often result in the transient expression of the transfected genes which may require selection for the stable integrations sometime it is also cell type specific so efficiency can be vary between the different cell type and the cell lines then the cost so that is the major issue that you are going to have a very high cost so the commercial lipid reagents can be expensive especially for the large scale transfections now let's talk about the next method and the next method is called as the bacteriofactin so bacteriofactin is a method where you are actually going to use a bacteria to harbor the dna and then bacteria is going to deliver the dna okay one of the classical example is the agrobacterium tumefaciens which is actually been used to deliver the dna into the plant cells this mode of gene transfer is very popular in the plant where the agrobacterium tumefaciens is used in animal cells the bacteria is actively been taken up by the host cell through a phagocytosis and the entrapped in a membranous vesicles known as the phagosomes uh then uh, the bacteria get escape from the phagosome and get lice to release the dna into the cytosol in alternate mechanism the bacteria get lysed inside the phagosome and the dna is released into the cytosol the bacterial species used in this method are salmonella shigella etc most of the strain used to deliver the dna are attenuated so they can be they can they should not cause any harm to the host cells so in this method you are using a bacteria right so you are going to use a bacteria so what you are doing is you first you are inserting a dna inside a bacteria and then this bacteria has a tendency that it is actually going to attack some of the cells and it is going to be taken up by a process called as phagocytosis that phagocytosis is uh, one, after the phagocytosis the bacteria is going to in, engulf into a membranous vesicles which is going to be called as the phagosome so this is going to be called as phagosomes and within the phagosomes uh, the bacteria is then enter into the cell and then it is actually going to deliver the dna okay because many of these bacteria uh, which we are using in this method is called salmonella or shigella they are resistant to withstand the uh, harsh conditions what is present inside the phagosomes and then this dna is going to be delivered into the nucleus and then this dna is going to be available for the active transfection or active uh, experiments if you cannot uh, understand some of these method like the phagosome you uh, and all those kind of things uh, it is uh, just okay you know because uh, this uh, you know 
we have to understand only that the it is going to be delivered the DNA bacteria is going to deliver a DNA by a process called phagocytosis and then the DNA is going to be released from the bacteria and it is going to be go to the nucleus for its function. So, this is what exactly going to happen you take the plasmid DNA you give it to the uh, you know you give it to the bacteria. So, it will remain inside the bacteria and then this bacteria is going to be taken up by a process of phagocytosis it is going to form the phagosome and then the DNA is going to release from the phagosome by uh, because uh, some of these bacteria are resistant to live inside the phagosome and then this release DNA can be used for the other kinds of experiments. So, this is all about the DNA delivery within the uh, different types of host cells we have discussed about the uh, bacterial expression system, we have discussed about the yeast expression system and we have discussed about the uh, mammalian expression system and we also discussed about the different types of methods within the mammalian expression system. So, we have discussed about the uh, chemical transfection reagents, we have discussed about the lipoflexamine lipoplexis, we have discussed about the liposome method and then we lastly we have also discussed about the bacteriofactin. So, once you deliver the DNA it is actually going to be uh, utilized and it, the cells are going to take up those DNA right. Now, the next task would be that how you are going to identify the bacteria which does not get the DNA and the bacteria which actually going to get the DNA ok. So, if you see the scheme of our gene cloning scheme right what we have discussed so far we have discussed about how you can be able to isolate the gene, how you can be able to digest the gene how you can be able to put it for the ligation right and how you can be able to deliver the DNA inside the cell right. So, this this cell could be bacteria, it could be yeast, it could be insect cell lines, it could be mammalian cells, it could be plant. Now, once you have done this after the transformation you are going to have the two species ok, you are going to have the host cells and you are going to have the host cells containing DNA right containing recombinant DNA. Now, both of these species will have some of the basic properties matching, but some of the things are different right because this one having the host cells containing the DNA this one is having the host cell alone. Now, you are you do not want these cells right because these cells are not going to be good because they are not going to work for the because they do not have the recombinant DNA. So, they will not work right. What you want is you want these cells right and how you going to you are going to in, so you have to ensure some mechanism. So, that you can be able to get only these cells from the host cells and there are multiple method there are multiple approaches one can actually be able to use. So, how you can be able to screen the recombinant uh, clones. So, we have T method we can actually be able to use the enzymes you can be able to use the selectable markers like the antibiotic resistance genes or you can actually be able to use the phenotypic changes. We will take the examples from each, the, each class so that it will be easier for you to understand that the when you are uh, cloning a, a recombinant DNA into a vector or a plasmid it actually provides you the ample uh, tools so that you can be able to screen the uh, untransfected host from the transformed source. So, for example, it has the lag Z. So, it is actually an enzyme right. So, it is actually going to give you uh, enzymatic reaction and you can actually be able to test which one is giving you the enzymatic reaction which one is giving you not. And uh, similarly, you have the ampicillin. So, this is the ampicillin resistance right. So, you can actually be able to say which is giving you the ampicillin resistance which is not right. So, this is the second method. And the third is the phenotype right. So, you can actually be able to see some phenotypic changes into the host and by looking at the cell itself you can be able to say that ok this is what is the cell which contains the DNA and this is the cell which does not contain the DNA. So, let us first start with the enzyme then we will talk about the antibiotic resistance gene and then we will talk about the phenotypic changes. So, the first method is the first method is called as the blue white screening right and blue white screening depends on an enzyme which is called as the lag Z right. We have just discussed in the previous slide right. So, the chromogenic substrate so since it lag Z is an enzyme right it is like going to catalyze the reaction. So, that is why you require a chromogenic substrate. 
the use of chromogenic substrate to detect a particular enzymatic activity is a basis to screen the desired clone in a blue white screening the most popular method system to exploit this feature is called as the blue white screening where a colorless substrate is processed into a colored compound the colorless compound x gal or its full name is 5 bromo 4 chloro 3 endolyl beta d galactosidase galactoside used in this screening method is a substrate for the beta galactosidase so lax z is expressing for an enzyme which is called as beta galactosidase the enzyme beta galactosidase is the product of lax z gene of the lacoperon it is a tetrameric protein and an initial N-terminal region of the protein is important for the activity of the protein. In this system, the host contains the lag Z without the initial region where the vector contains the alpha peptide to complement the defect to form the active enzyme. As a result, if the vector containing the alpha peptide will be transformed into the host containing remaining, remaining lag Z, the two fragments will reconstitute to form the active enzyme. In addition, the alpha peptide region in a vector containing multiple cloning sites and a result of insertion of the gene fragment, consequently alpha peptide will not be synthesized to give the fully active beta galactosidase. The benzyme beta galactosidase oxidizes the X gal to form the 5 bromo 4 chloro indolyl and the galactose. The indolyl derivative is oxidized in air to give the blue color, right? which is a dibromo dichloro derivatives however blue colored colonies indicate the presence of an active enzyme or the absence of insert where colorless colonies indicate presence of an insert so this is what here it is shown actually so lag z has the two component one it is actually going to have a missing uh, I mean, 11 to 41 amino acids right and this missing portion is present onto the vector okay so, if you do not have this, it you are going to express uh, inactive beta galactosidase, okay. But if you have this, right, if you have get this additional um, block, then the uh, it is going to give you the uh, fully active enzyme, okay. So, what will happen is that if the lag Z is full, right, it is actually going to give you the lag Z fragment, okay. And this lag Z fragment, when it will in when it will going to combine with this inactive beta galactosidase which is going to express from the uh, from the vector from the host it is going to give you the active beta galactosidase okay and active what the active beta galactosidase will go it is actually going to convert the x gal into a blue colored compound okay this means if the enzyme is active that means the lag z is complete right and it is going to give you the complete fragment and that is how it is generating the beta galactosidase and that is how you are getting the blue white colonies ok. So, in this case you are actually going to get the two different types of colonies you are going to get a white colony and you are going to get the blue colony. Now, blue colony you where the enzyme is active. And under what condition the enzyme is active that your vector does not contain the insert right your vector contains only the uh, pure enzyme ok. And you are going to get the white colonies where the enzyme is not active enzyme is not active and why it is not active because you have cloned uh, your gene in between ok. So, you are actually going to generate it is actually going to generate a fragment which will actually going to have your gene right and because your gene is there it is actually going to synthesize uh, inactive enzyme right. If it is synthesizing an inactive enzyme this means it is going to be a real clone. So, this is actually going to be a clone of interest right and this is going to be the empty vector which does not contain your clone of interest. So, this is actually going to be your desirable clone because it is a white colony and this is a empty vector which actually does not contain the insert that is why it is giving you the blue colony. 
So, this is what reaction it is going to create. So, this is the X gal right and when it is going to be uh, endoxyl derivative when it is. So, it is going this is uh, it is going to be uh, air dry and that is how it is actually going to give you the 5 pi bromo 4 4 dichloro indolyl and this is a blue colored compound which is going to be formed inside the cell. Then we have the antibiotic sensitivity. So, vectors carrying a functional selection marker such as antibiotic resistance genes to be used to select the clones. The antibiotic resistance gene product has a multiple mechanism to provide the resistance into the host cell. In this approach, a circular plasmid containing antibiotic resistance can be able to replicate into the host cell plated onto a antibiotic containing media. In the cloning of a fragment into the plasmid, the plasmid is cut with recession enzyme and a fragment in the ligated to give circular plasmid with insert. The transformation of both the DNA species cut plasmid and circularized clone into the host and plated onto the antibiotic containing solid media. Only the circularized clone gives colonies whereas the cut plasmid will not grow as it does not it has lost the antibiotic resistant genes. So, you have a different types of antibiotics and you also have the different types of resistant genes. For example, you have for ampicillin we have a beta galactosidase, beta lactamase and the beta what is the role of the beta lactamase? Uh, it is actually going to degrade the ampicillin and that is how it is conferring the resistance into the uh, bacteria. Then we have the canamycin. So, canamycin is uh, the gene product is the neomycin phosphotransferase 2 and what it is doing it is doing the covalent modification of the canamycin so that it does not be able to have the ability to bind the ribosome and that is how it cannot interfere into the translation and that is how it is actually providing uh, conferring the resistance against the canamycin. Then we have the tetracyclines. So, it is a ribosomal protein protection proteins and efflux of tetracycline outside of the bacteria. So, it is actually going to throw out the bacteria tetracycline out of the bacterial cell. Then we have the chloramphenicol. So, chloramphenicol acyl transferase. So, it is also going to modify the chloramphenicol in such a way that chloramphenicol will not be able to work properly. So, it is going to convert the chloramphenicol to the acetyl chloramphenicol and as a result of this it is not going to inhibit the translation. So, these are the some of the gene product what you require for acquiring the resistance against the particular antibiotic and this is the mechanism through which you can be able to generate right. So, you can see that you have two different types of vectors you have the uh, circularized vector and you where you have the recombinant clone right you have insert and you have ampicillin right resistance and this is the cut vector right. So, when you plate or you transform both of these are going to be transformed. But since this is a not circularized vector, it is going to, going to uh, acquire the resistance against the ampicillin, right? And as a result, it is not going to give you a colony. Whereas when you are plating this, right, it is actually having a functionally active ampicillin resistance, uh, ampicillin resistance genes, which is going to express for uh, beta lactamase, right? So it is going to act, express the beta lactamase and beta lactamase is going to degrade the ampicillin what is present in, in this particular plate and as a result this particular bacteria is going to grow and it is actually going to give you the different types of colonies. Now, the third method is the insertional inactivations. Okay? So, insertional inactivation um, in this approach a foreign DNA is cloned within the coding gene responsible for a particular phenotype. As a result of insertion, the gene product is not available to modulate the phenotype of the host. This approach is known as insertional inactivation and it can be used with the suitable genetic system. Now, take a few examples of insertional inactivations. So, insertional inactivation of the Laxi genes. So, uh, Laxi, uh, we already discussed, right? Laxi is is a is a is a gene which is actually going to express for the beta galactosidase, and beta galactosidase is going to convert the colorless uh, X gal into uh, uh, into a colored product, which is a blue colored product. So this reaction can be monitored and can be in can be inactivated with the help of this cloning reactions, right? So insertional inactivation of Laxi genes. 
So, lac G is a part of lac operon and it is responsible for the synthesis of beta galactosidase. Exgal system can be used to detect the insertional inactivation of the lac D gene to screen the cloned fragment. If the gene is inserted into the lac Z, the, lac, the clone will not be able to produce a functional beta galactosidase. Hence, the blue colored colonies indicate the presence of an active enzyme or the absence of insert whereas, the color led colonies indicate the presence of insert. So, you can imagine this is a two situation, the situation number one the situation number two. In the situation number one, you have the intact lac Z because this does not contain the insert and in that case it is actually going to give you the functional beta galactosidase and what the functional beta galactosidase is going to do, it is going to uh, convert the X gal into a blue colored colony, blue colored product that means you are actually going to get the blue colored colonies. So, these blue colored colonies are uh, the colonies coming from the vector which does not contain insert, so there is no insert right. This means it is useless for your uh, for recombinant DNA applications. Whereas in this case, you have inserted a, uh, the insert utilizing a restriction enzyme like BAMH1, for example. So if you insert the uh, your insert with the help of a restriction enzyme which is called as BAMH1, so what will happen is that it is going to be get inserted. This means you have disrupted the lag Z, right? You have a small amount of lag Z on this side you have a small amount of lag Z of this side, but the major chunk of the lag Z is being replaced with the insert which contains the BAMH1. And now what will happen is that it is actually going to generate a non-functional beta galactosidase. This means it will not be able to convert the X gal into a blue colored product and as a result you are going to see a white colony or the colorless colony. This means this col these colonies are going to have the vector which contains the insert. And this is very important because these are the colonies you are looking for and these colonies you can actually be able to propagate further for the uh, for the different types of applications. Now we have the insertional inactivation of the antibiotic resistance genes. So this is an example of the PBR32 where you have the two, ampicillin resistance, two, ampic two antibiotic resistance genes, one is ampicillin, the other one is the tetracycline, right. So, uh, bacterial plasmid PBR32 has two antibiotic resistance genes ampicillin and the tetracycline. If a gene fragment will be cloned in SCA1, right? So, SCA1 is an extension enzyme, it will disrupt the ampicillin resistance gene and as a result, the clone will be ampicillin sensitive and the tetracycline resistant. Whereas, the original plasmid will be ampicillin resistance and as well as the tetracycline resistance. To select the clone, first the transform E. coli is plated onto a tetracycline containing media. Subsequently, a replica plate will be made onto the ampicillin containing media to identify the clone growing on the tetracycline media but not onto the ampicillin media. So, in this case, what will happen is that you have the ampicillin resistance genes, you have the tetracycline resistance genes. Now, what you are going to do is you are going to insert, uh, you are going to insert your fragment, right? with the help of the SCA1 restriction enzyme. So, what will happen is that it had disrupted the ampicillin resistance. So, it is actually disrupted the ampicillin resistance. Now, what you are going to do is you are going to do a screening in such a way that the colonies will grow on the uh, tetracycline resistance plate, but it will not grow onto the ampicillin resistance plate. So, uh, those are the positive clones, these are, these are the positive clones which are actually be not growing on the ampicillin resistance, but they are growing on the tetracycline. Then the third example is the insertional inactivation of the CI, okay. CI is a repressor which is required for the, um, for the virus to switch from the lysogeny and the lytic cycles. So, during an infection cycle, the virus undergoes a lytic and the lysogenic stages. Remember that all these we have discussed when we were talking about the bacteriophage and M13 phase and all those kind of things. So, the lytic cycle is responsible for the lysis of the host to release the virus particle whereas the lysogenic stage allow the replication of the virus without lysing of the host. The CI gene encodes for the CI repressor and which is responsible for the formation of lysogens. In the presence of functional CI, the plaque containing unlysed host cells and has a turbid appearance, whereas in the presence of, in the absence it will be clear. This feature can be used to screen the clone to detect the functional CI 
or the absence of CI. Okay. So, you can see that this is a CI repressor right and it is its job is that it is going to uh, convert the lytic into the lysogenic cycle and once get into the lysogeny it will not going to form any plaque right. So, this means if you have a functional a CI repressor it is going to have the no plaque right. Uh, whereas, in a inactive lys uh, in inactive uh, CI repressor the cell will remain into the lytic phase and as well as as a result they are actually going to form the plaque. So, when you have the functional CI which means you are going to have the no absence of clone this means when you do not get the plaque it is actually going to indicate that that particular vector does not contain any clone, but if you are getting the plaque then it will be showing that it is actually containing a clone. So, these are the some of the techniques of the insertional inactivation, these are the some of the examples of the insertional inactivations, there are many more method or many more examples. Now, let us talk about the another method which is called as the complementation of the mutations. So, complementation of the mutation in this approach a mutant host strain can be used to screen the plasmid containing the missing gene and the transformants will grow only if the gene product from the clone will be complement the functions. In general the gene taking part in, in the metabolic pathway or biology pathway are routinely being used for this purpose right. So, there are three important requirements for this approach to work. Number one the host strain should be deficient of a particular gene. If the gene belongs to the biosynthetic pathway the mutant host in this case are called oxotrophs as host depends on to the gene product or the final product of the biosynthetic pathway as a supplement in media for the growth. Number 2 a defined media with the missing nutrients and number 3 a vector containing the gene to supply the gene product to the complement. Let us take an example of the complementation of the mutations. So, you have a negative selection you remember that so far what we were whatever the selection we were discussing we were discussing about the positive selection where you were actually selecting the clones right and this is this mode of selection is called as positive clone positive selection whereas in this case you are going to do a negative selection. So, in the negative selection a chemical compound is added into the media which will be converted into a cytotoxic agent in the presence of gene product and as a result of it allow the growth of the wild type cells. But the host strain transformed with the recombinant clone has non functional gene product and grow in the presence of the compound into the media. So, this means you have a ura 3 right and ura 3 is actually going to produce a enzyme which is called as the OMP decarboxylase and what is the function of the OMP decarboxylase it is actually going to convert a compound which is called as 5 fluorooric acid into a fluorodeoxyuridine and fluorodeoxyuridine is a toxic compound. So, if you are going to have a functional enzyme right it is going to create uh, convert this product uh, compound into a toxic product and that is how it is actually going to kill all the cells and that is why there will be no colony. Whereas, when you are going to insert a uh, fragment utilizing a BAMH1 restriction enzyme then you are actually going to produce a non functional OMP decarboxylase right and OMP decarboxylase the non functional OMP decarboxylase will not be able to convert the 5 fluorooric acid into a fluorodeoxyuridine and as a result you are actually going to see the colonies. Now, let us talk about how you are going to screen the transfected mammalian cells. So, you can actually have the reporter gene assays. So, in the reporter gene assay a chimeric construct is produced with an enzyme gene clone in front of the promoter of a gene of interest. The gene reporter gene construct the general construct contain a eukaryotic promoter and an enzyme for easy readout. So, what you have is you have a promoter and you have a reporter gene reporter gene are the gene which are actually going to express a enzyme and these enzymes are going to convert the substrate into a product. So, and these products are going to give you a uh, output ok. So, uh, these are the, so what you are going to do is you are going to take this uh, construct we are going to put it into the uh, into the into, uh, into the mammalian cells and then you will ask whether you are getting this particular output or not. You have the multiple options different types of reporter genes you can use the CAD you can use the LAXZ you can use the luciferase you can use the 4A 
and you can use GFP. And these are the gene product and these are the reactions what they are going to catalyze. For example, if you are using the luciferase, okay, so you are actually going to use the luciferase to give you the uh, light actually, so it is going to give you the bioluminescence. Uh, so, rep luciferase reported gene system, luciferase is an enzyme which is present in the upper, uh, abdomen of the firefly fortinus pyrelis. The enzyme utilizes the d luciferine uh, substrate to form the oxyluciferine. So, you see here that the uh, enzyme is actually converting the luciferine into the luciferine adnylate with the help of uh, the one molecule of ATP. And then this luciferine adnylate is getting converted into the oxyluciferine and in this process it is actually converting the oxygen into uh, and it is utilizing the oxygen and as well as the uh, AMP to produce the light. Okay. So, this light you can actually be able to detect inside the cell and that is how you can be able to say whether a uh, functional luciferase is present or not. So, in the presence of the ATP magnesium luciferin is getting converted into luciferin adnylate involving the phosphoprotein cleavage and transfer of AMP to luciferin and the luciferin adnylate undergoes oxidative decarboxylation to the oxyluciferin with the simultaneous emission of the light. The reporter gene construct containing the luciferin is transferred, transferred, transfected into the mammalian cells. The cells are washed by PBS and lies in a uh, lysis buffer take the lysate into the luminometer and you can actually be able to uh, monitor or measure the uh, the intensity of this particular light so this is what exactly what you see this is a luminometer where you are going to put your plate so what you are going to do is you are going to plate the cells right and then you are going to have a positive control and a negative control and then you are going to add the substrate and then you put that into a luminometer and what luminometer is going to do is it is going to give you the signal for the uh, for the light what is going to come out. Then the second is uh, you can actually be able to use the GFP as the uh, transfection reagent right. Uh, so, you can actually be able to know that the GFP is going to give you a green fluorescence and that green fluorescence is uh, coming only when the GFP is present along with your construct. So, it is actually can be used there are multiple method you can actually be able to use the flow cytometry and all other kinds of uh, high end techniques that we are not discussing in this particular lecture. So, uh, this is all about the, uh, uh, the, the DNA de delivery and the screening of the clones right. So, far what we have discussed we have discussed about the recombinant DNA technology we have discussed about how you can be able to isolate the gene of interest how you can be able to uh, the, 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 de deliver the DNA into the bacterial expression system and how you can be able to deliver the DNA into the yeast insect cell line and as well as the mammalian system. And once you deliver the DNA how you can be able to screen these uh, transfected DNA. So, uh, you can be able to use the antibiotic resistance gene, you can be able to use the enzymes and you can also be able to see the phenotypic changes into the cell. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we will discuss some more aspects of the gene cloning. Thank you.